Live from Santa Clara, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Juniper Next Work 2016. Brought to you by Juniper. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Stu Miniman. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live in Silicon Valley for theCUBE. This is SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Stu Miniman. Our next guest is Doug McCullough, who's the CIO of the city of Dublin in Ohio, not in Ireland. So it's not going to be a beer conversation. Uh, of course, theCUBE was in Dublin this past <laughs> year for Hortonworks. We had a lot of fun there. Doug, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, great to be here. So tell us what do you do, uh, first of all, what does the CIO do uh, in the city of Dublin? What is your role and how, what are the things you work on? What are the things you're passionate about? Sure, well I'm the first CIO for the city of Dublin. Uh, previously had an IT director, there are subtle differences. So larger than uh, dealing only with the technology of the city, which we call keeping the trains running and the lights on, uh, I deal with the larger strategy of technology in the city. I do a lot more with economic development. Uh, concern myself with making the city of Dublin a digital hub, an attractive place for other technology companies, building a community for technologists, so I'm doing my part as a member of senior staff for the general staff. You have an IT background, you've done all that IT mm -hmm. stuff, been, been, been there, done that on, on yep. the IT side. Yes. So my question for, I love this conversation, because now that, you know, we love at theCUBE social impact, right? Because we, you know, we, whether we're talking about women in tech and education, there's a lot of new technology impacts with digital transformation mm -hmm. around social impact. Certainly cities and public sector, towns and cities, whatnot, are impacted by digital transformation. Yes. So what is that all about? <laughs> People perceive it as slow moving government, but yet IOG hits the government, IT is part of the transformation mm -hmm. in these cities because a digital fabric is a competitive advantage not only for the, how to run the city, mm -hmm. but for the citizens and yeah. the community. So it's all a melting pot now. What is this new fabric about? Share with your thoughts on this new, this, this new environment. Yeah, I really appreciate that question. It's a, it's a good question because what I find is, as citizens, as members of a community, we have a certain level of demand for the companies around us, whether it be Facebook Messenger or Google or the services that we use, and uh, we just expect it to be great and be there and always advance constantly. And we've given the public sector a pass or have written it off in some senses. I don't know how long that's going to be able to last. Public sector is going to be expected to innovate with at least uh, excellent cycles like the private sector is. And that means uh, more push technologies, that means more IOT, yeah. that means strong networks, uh, better services, e-services, <laughs> those kinds of things. So I think we're finding that the impact to us is that we've got to innovate as fast as the private sector. You know what's interesting about this conversation, I love it too by the way, because it's not only provocative, but it's very relevant. Mm -hmm. In the analog world that we live in, the, the role of the city and the town and governments is strategically important to everyone's life. They have a hat town, they want safety, they want roads to drive on, they want things to be there that have been working for generations mm -hmm. for them in an analog world. Okay, yeah. now I'll go to digitization, they're going to, I think, expect, what you're saying is expect similar betterment and for their lives that they currently have in the analog. So this brings up the IOT question, Internet mm -hmm. of Things. This is certainly going to be an impact. The, and we were talking before we came on, the, how big the T is in IOT. Mm -hmm. So just from a value proposition standpoint, the user, the citizen, has a great value relationship with the city and town. But they kind of take advantage to maybe they think about it that way, but digital you can't, it's always connected. So talk about that gap between analog and digital, government, city, services, community. It's comfortable for us to forget about uh, the, uh, the government. And it's interesting you brought up roads and police and those kinds of things. Sometimes we go to the lowest common denominator, but we can talk about that. Well, what is police in a digital environment? What is a road? And you know, we're dealing with connected vehicles and autonomous vehicles research. Uh, what is a road anymore? It used to be pavement, and uh, cities were responsible for setting the laws, the speed limit, painting them, maintaining them, those kinds of things. Well, when you're no longer driving, and when you uh, are being led along according to a different rule set, and there's all sorts of data, who's going to manage that? Well, it's still going to be a city. We're responsible for the infrastructure that moves people, the public safety, all sorts of things. So, we find ourselves shifting into more cameras, more uh, uh, sensors, uh, uh, more intelligence that allows uh, speeds to be changed. When we dream about the traffic controls and the platooning of trucks and all of those things, 
Who's going to do that? Well, a government is going to have to be enlightened enough There's to no be There's no pixie in. dust out there. There's no magic elves no, out there No, we've got to it. advance ourselves to another level of function, so. Doug, for, for so long we, we've talked about, you know, enterprises that want to create change. Uh, for the government, you know, people often have the misperception that it's like, oh well, you know, they've got no budget, you know, they can't do things, and oh, they're a bureaucracy, so they're, therefore, you know, change isn't something that government is usually known for doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you hear the discussion here about kind of, you know, Rami talked about beyond digital transformation, um, you know, what sort of things are, are you doing in, in your job to help, you know, drive innovation, you know, and, and create some of that digital transformation. Yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate to work for Dublin, Ohio. I've worked for more than one city, and, and it is expected and, and appreciated by our residents to be a changing place, an innovative place. And so, first of all, we're building a community of technology professionals. Uh, second of all, uh, we communicate with our residents a lot more uh, readily and speedily, uh, and they are open to certain amounts of change. So we've created the Dublink fiber conduit system, which is something that a lot of other communities were not prepared to do. Uh, our community is uh, comfortable with the investments that we want to make. So, <clears throat> I, I think also I could talk to you about our 100 gigabyte, uh, gigabit excuse me, project in which we are investing in uh, our fiber optics network for the transport layer to get businesses to carriers. We subsidize that. That's a significant business model change that our business community can take advantage of. So, those are the kinds of things that that we do in order to accomplish innovation. Yeah, Doug, if you wouldn't mind, unpack for our audience a little bit. Uh, you know, what is the impact of that optical network mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, the, the 100 gig? I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of cutting it, edge. It's interesting, so we are targeting a legacy office park. I'm looking at 13 different buildings for which we're concerned and interested about the, uh, the uh, number of tenants in those. The more businesses you move into a community, the more jobs you have, the better your revenue is. So instead of having a tax abatement model, City of Dublin has a, uh, let us lower your costs as a business. Broadband is now one of the, and, and digital services are one of the biggest costs for businesses, particularly smaller ones that don't have large staffs. Um, you've got to lower their costs. And so we've targeted a, a legacy office park. We've uh, put in Juniper equipment of up to 100 gigabits uh, per second, uh, edge equipment and a core uh, carrier grade <laughs> network in our metro, metro data center, and uh, we are attracting businesses to the area. We've, this is our first year, yeah. and we're looking at other legacy office parks in the area as well. Be careful what you create, there's a monster in there. 100 gig, that's going to attract a lot of people who would love the bandwidth. Well, it's I interesting, mean, people say, uh, well, I could never use uh, 100 gigabits, but the moment you give people a gig, they start using a gig. When you give them 10 gigs, they do that. And we have a, a R&D specialist that's doing a analysis, and their business was able to grow to 10 gigs of, of capacity because they had it. So. Yeah, it, it opens it's up creativity <laughs> for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. they, knowing they have more headroom on the connectivity, more servers can be deployed, more mm -hmm. things can be built. Absolutely. Yeah, it's Jevon's paradox, I always say, from a power standpoint, if I, I save a little bit of power, um, I'm always going to use it up. If you give people bandwidth, people That's are right. going to use it. Uh, how do you have to look at security, though? Are you just providing the platform and the, the end users responsible for the security, or how does security play we into it? We work for, with a third party to secure that part of our network. Mm -hmm. Our Dublink conduit system, we do use it in the city for our own uses. We run our phone, link, uh, our phone systems on it, all of our internet. Uh, we do shared services with other public entities in the area. We secure that. So uh, uh, we're running some pretty high powered security stuff. I was glad with the uh, presentation this morning that, that we are right in line with uh, what's happening there. Uh, our city network is my greatest concern though. Okay, and how do you as, as, a, as a city organization tie in with you know, not only the businesses but you know, surrounding organizations? Are there any kind of consortiums or how, how do you make sure that this kind of activity pro proliferates? Well, uh, we work very closely, I, I, I work closely with our economic development folks. As an IT professional, typically I've worked with IT for my whole career. Uh, I'm now working with economic development. City of Columbus in our region has a second to none uh, uh, economic development organization, it's Columbus 2020, and we do a lot of coordination between business, uh, universities, we have uh, strategic relationships with Ohio University as well as Ohio State University, Center for Automotive Research. Uh, Battelle uh, is a premier research firm in the area. So we have established these relationships and a lot of public-private partnerships, and that keeps us on top of that. So what's the philosophy of, oh, let me take a step back. 
other folks out there have been trying to crack this nut, bridging digitization with the analog world. What are some of the best practices that you've learned that you'd like to share with folks around you know, how to foster that collaboration? Because there's a lot of moving parts. You have the modernization of the actual government city or town. You get some state, federal stuff to deal mm -hmm. with too. So the normal regulations. But you have the community as well. How do you balance that innovation because you could be a, swim, a, a fish swimming upstream on one side with the, kind of the, the government side, public sector side, but yet the pace of innovation that the users expect, the consumerization, might be very rapid. How are you guys doing that and what would you share for folks who are looking for advice? Sure, well what I, I recommend to other communities is that you need certain components. You need a relationship with higher education uh, universities. You need a relationship with healthcare in some way. Uh, healthcare systems, large ones, are really great. Your business community, which you can typically get access to through your chamber or direct relationships. And, uh, and other governments, sister governments in the area, a lot of collaboration there. Um, our, our region also benefits from having a major manufacturer in the area, that's Honda Manufacturing of America and Honda R&D. So some of the big suppliers if they are meeting with you and having conversations. And we also meet quite frequently with our residents that uh, give us plenty of feedback. We're blessed with a number of uh, executives in the area who are CEOs of a, a number of uh, headquarters. Wendy's is there, uh, Cardinal Health, a lot of uh, Fortune 100, Fortune 50 companies. Uh, so these are the folks who help advise us. But government sometimes has to get out of its own way. Don't get too big, disappear if you can be small, efficient, and innovative. What's the number one thing that you work on in terms of stack ranking the demand from the, the residents and the demands of the city? If you had to kind of blend them and converge them together, yeah. what would be the list of the top three or couple things you'd work on, that you work on? Well, there's a quality of place that needs to be there. And so you do focus on your residents and what their comments are. If you lose your residents' opinion, you're in a real trouble. There's also a, a uh, quality of, uh, of space for your business community. If they're not coming to you and find you an attractive place to locate, you're in a lot of trouble. And then there are visitors, uh, people who are going to come for your public art, your festivals. There's a lot of money that comes into a community through that. So I, I would say that none of those are in conflict with each other. And if you're small enough and fast enough, you can respond to problems that you may have in one particular area and innovative in all three of them. And so you see that having businesses lower their cost of operating in the, in the area helps the economic situation? It's, it's one of many things, uh, but it's more efficient than the traditional ways of attracting businesses to your community. I'll tell you, things like uh, parks, running trails, bike lanes, uh, there are so many different economic development aspects to it, but then you need high broadband, you need reliable internet in your community. The new roads, they used to call it the information superhighway, yeah. now they call it the web and the internet. Back in this, I'm dating myself back in the 90s, but this is, these are the new perks and, and, and requirements now. Right, no longer a perk. It, it's it, a requirement. It, it is now table stakes to have stable internet not only in your neighborhoods, but for your businesses. And that's why we invested in our 100 gig network yeah. because uh, having stable, reliable internet with competition yeah. amongst carriers. If you've got two carriers or three carriers, that's not enough. We've and got a dozen. And having some good bike trails gives some good Snapchat creative capabilities. Uh, <laughs> Snapchat aside, just joking, of course, mm -hmm. is this is the analog side of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the economic development. It's not just digital. It's the analog world converging in. The bike paths, the, the environment, mm -hmm. for, for the comfort of the... Yeah, I, I, I don't know about analog anymore. I'll tell you, <laughs> since, since Pokemon Go, you know, we've got people running around our parks looking at our public art, looking at our historic buildings. So we really do see analog and digital have con converged. Augmented reality, certainly Absolutely. on your radar, big mm -hmm. time. Sure thing. And the cameras, you see have totally digitized camera systems? Uh, we do, and we're continuing to invest. There's a build out in cameras and sensors that that is comparable to where fiber was years ago. I mean, the bike sharing stuff, you've seen stuff in the big cities, the bike mm -hmm. sharing has been great, I've seen in Europe. Um, Absolutely, and, and the digital services are key to being able to maintain those programs. And, and they should be invisible. You shouldn't have to think about, this is what the private companies do. You don't think about how do I engage that service. It just appears when you need it. Obviously security is important. Obviously being a public sector area could be a targeted attack. Mm -hmm. A lot of value there, who knows? I mean, it's attackers are doing drive-bys, right? So Yeah, we are constantly under attack by foreign governments and, and uh, uh, different actors, uh, all governments are, and uh, we've got some pretty good strategies to keep us safe. All right, well thanks for so much for sharing 
your uh, insight on theCUBE, we appreciate it. Thank you. And we are live here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman. Networks 2016, Juniper Networks User Conference, annual user conference. This is theCUBE back for the second year of coverage of the event. We'll be back with more live coverage after this short break.